Hello everyone and welcome to Michigan Bird Nerd on 13 Plus and the 13 on your side YouTube page. I'm Matt Gard and we shot this episode in the month of January, which means the Super Bowl is coming up, or as we in the birding community call it, Superb Owl Sunday. Do you get it? Yeah, that's right. This is the time of year where we celebrate one of the most popular birds in the animal kingdom, the owl. And to help me do that, I have got a very special guest joining me on this episode of Michigan Bird Nerd. We're going to meet her on the other end of that open. So get your binoculars ready and let's get birding. <laughs> I want you to first introduce yourself, uh, tell the viewers who you are. I'm Sarah Chertos and I'm the Wildlife Education Specialist here at Blanford Nature Center. Tell me a little bit about Blanford and what makes this a great place to go bird watching. We have all kinds of different habitats. We've got forest with evergreens, we've got forest with the deciduous trees, we've got our open fielded space like our meadow, we've got the Brandywine Creek that runs through the brilliant Blanford property, and wetlands like vernal ponds and permanent ponds. So those are really good spaces to go birding, whether you're looking for some waterfowl, maybe you're looking for birds that are passing through for migration. We get a lot of kinglets and warblers and things like that that come through and don't necessarily stick around. And then of course we've got some permanent birds Birds that in the winter we've got our winter flocks of nuthatches and chickadees and woodpeckers and we've also got birds of prey that claim the property so we know that we've seen red-tailed hawks just this last year we're hearing red-shouldered hawks we know we have coopers and sharp shins and great horns and barred owls that claim the property we're hoping to get more information and hear more a little a little bit of having screech owls back here but this is a really good place to have kind of in the middle of the city to have a break from the regular hustle and bustle of daily life and just immerse yourself in the forest. So tell me about Luna. So this is Luna the barn owl and she is our female barn owl. She actually came from the state of Washington and she was hit by the by a car in 2011 and we were able to receive her in 2012 and at the time we weren't exactly sure which part of her wing was damaged because the scans and such looked really good but her flight test proved that she could not fly. So like a lot of our other birds of prey that get hit by cars and acquire wing damage she can hop and she can glide but she cannot truly fly and for owls flight is so important to go hunting it's important to get away from predators but as a barn owl we're really thankful to have her as a representative here in Michigan because barn owls are endangered in Michigan and so even though Luna is not flighted and wouldn't be able to hunt and avoid predators and get up into trees she's a really good representative of her species and she's one that helps me remind people of ways that they can help owls and especially owls that are endangered like long-eared and short-eared and barn owls and some things that people can do are putting up nest boxes to give them an opportunity to nest successfully because as an older species they're very particular about where they nest they prefer large old trees and in Michigan we don't have that due to the logging era but also building brush piles to encourage your prey to have a, lo a, a centralized location to go where the owls will hunt and stalk the brush pile and having farmers keep up their wooden barns even though they're using metal barns because the metal barns are more effective and efficient but the wooden barns offer them a chance to nest and to roost in up in the lofty areas and to switch from things like rodenticides to good old snap traps live traps and things like that to get rid of pests because a lot of toxic poisoning in the lower portions of the food chain are working their way up to the barn owls and we're losing them here in Michigan. So would you think that the odds of you seeing a barn owl in the wild, unless you happen to have an old abandoned barn on your property, probably pretty slim, right? It is. And when we find out that people are sure that it is a barn owl, we get a lot of people who say, oh, I have a barn owl, and they show a photo of a barred owl. As we know, those are two different species. But if we find that people do genuinely have a barn owl on their property or find, some, find one somewhere, like a few years ago, the Kalamazoo Nature Center president found one on their property. It is so important to alert the DNR, eBird, Cornell, Audubon. That way we can keep track of where they are successfully surviving maybe not necessarily nesting. What are some of the telltale signs, the field markings you would you would tell somebody to look for if they think they saw a barn owl? 
So barn owls are a pretty slender species. They're not as slender as long-eared owls, for instance. They do not have tufts on the top of their head, like great horns, long-eared screeches. And if you can see their face, their face is more distinctly shaped like a heart, their facial disc is, compared to the oval or circular disc of other owls. And the same thing goes for coloration, that you're gonna see a lot of gold and white on their chest as they're flying overhead. They'd rather blend in with a time where the sun is just rising or setting versus a dark shadow like the barred owls or the great horned owls. And of course, when you're thinking barred versus barn, these guys don't have stripes going up and down their body like a barred owl specifically would. So you're looking at more light coloration. There's lots of speckling on their chest. That can be a lot harder to tell from afar. But another thing to know is their feet, that even though all owls of Michigan have feathers all the way down their toes for warmth in the winter, as well as continuing to muffle their sound when they're flying so they can maintain silent flight, Barn owls have these kind of scraggly feather structures, so their feet look bald. And a lot of people can confuse that with hawk and falcon feet, which traditionally here in Michigan, they do not have feathers down their toes like owls do. Vocalization is another thing, right? Because they, they have that trademark scream that, yes. you, that you mentioned. Not all owls say who. This is a, an example of an owl that does not say who. They are a source of early ghost stories for the Europeans that came to North America. And Pa would go out to check his barn and this white swooping figure would fly overhead screaming at him and he'd think, oh, my barn is haunted. But really, it was just a barn owl keeping some of the rodent population in his barn and on his farm in control. So they have this very high pitched scream. <laughs> You know, owls are notorious for uh, being rodent seekers, and I would assume that that is the exact same case with the barn owl. Yes, definitely a open fielded farmland hunter. And what's amazing is these guys actually have a different setup of breast muscles than the other owl species in that they're excellent hoverers. So they can hover over an open fielded space to look out in the grasses for prey. That's also one way that the males court the females is they hover in front of her and dangle their little toes and offer her treats. But yeah, they're definitely really good at scoping out the prey that are hiding in the grasses under the leaves. And what's interesting interesting is a lot of places in North America, barn owls are actually crepuscular. So rather than being strictly nocturnal or strictly, di strictly diurnal, they're going to be out at dusk and dawn and utilize that hunting time. So they're not in as much competition with the other owls. Luna is one of the OGs, as I like to say, at Blanford. Again, a lot of you may remember her being on the wildlife trail. Now she's indoors, so don't worry. She's here getting her medicine, eating her food, drinking her water, doing well inside. But she's just definitely a queen of the roost. I would say that barn owls just remind me of some type of beautiful painting. They are just like artwork. And I'll turn her around for a second so that you can see once again that gold laying over the brown that when the bark of the tree has a lot of sunshine on it at dusk and dawn, that's going to be a lot different than nocturnal camouflage. So I just think Luna is a beautiful, beautiful representative of her species and just looks like art. All right. So who's this? So we've got Dr. Hoot, our Eastern Screech Owl. He's a red morph Eastern Screech Owl, which is why you can see a lot of that reddish brown coloration on him. The other common color morph in Michigan being the gray morph. We talked a little bit off camera about people who think that these are baby great horned owls. So what field markings would you look at to indicate this is not a baby great horned owl, this is an eastern screech owl? Owls often don't look like themselves in their juvenile plumage as they do in their adult plumage. So some really important things to keep in mind is that great horned owls will have this really lovely white disking on the edge of their facial disc and it looks just like someone took a white paintbrush and just kind of did a little trickling on the edge. They do have tufts that similar to a screech owl and that's just an exaggerated fact that their camouflage is amazing. So I can totally get why people would think that a screech owl is a baby great horned owl. But another thing is screech owls will have a lot more, once again, white on their body and the center of their face versus the facial disc. Great horned owls will also have this beautiful white chest lining of feathers. And so body size is gonna be huge that because he is in his adult plumage, probably not gonna get much larger than this. In fact, not gonna get much larger than this. Once you see them in their adult coloration, you can guess, okay, that's probably roughly their adult size. They're not gonna get much larger than this. He's got this constantly uh, 
concerned and alert look to him, but that is very notorious of his species that because he's so small, though he they are efficient predators, they are also prey. So it's important to keep an eye and an ear out for what's going on around them. But he is the king of you can't see me. And so he will get into his enclosure, go to the very top of the branch system we have for him. And he gets as close as he can to the trunk of that branch system. And he just sits there like, oh, no, no, there's no owl here. I'm just bark on this tree. And so it's pretty funny how often he really thinks he's going unseen when we're looking directly at him. Dr. Hoot's a little smaller. Is he still going to go after her? you know, rodents? They're pretty feisty. They will take on a red squirrel if given the opportunity, but they'll eat a lot of things like large insects. They'll eat snakes. I recently learned that screech owls are excellent tree frog hunters, which makes a lot of sense that they're hanging out in the same spaces and that tree frog is probably not thinking about it. And the owl's like, hey, you grab and eat. But yeah, they will eat mice, voles, chipmunks, small things like that because they have a lot of power to their pounce. And as long as they can knock their prey out, out with that pounce, they have a quick opportunity to sever the spine and then that animal's subdued and it won't be as much effort after that. The big thing being, can I lift it up and take it into my tree? Because a little screech owl isn't going to want to just stay on the ground eating their food because then they're susceptible to being eaten by a great horned owl, a red-tailed hawk, a raccoon. So for them, it's going to be, can I knock it out real quick, sever its spine, and then once I've eaten parts of it, if I want to keep it, because these guys are excellent cashers, especially in the winter, can I bring it up into my tree hole or not? So where might a person find an eastern screech owl? So the fun thing about screech owls, barred owls, and great horned owls is they can be found in a lot of different places from urbanized spaces to rural spaces. These guys like to hunt in city areas for rodents and large insects that like where human activity is. But they also are one that like relatively undisturbed forests. They're not as picky as long ears where they don't need the contiguous forest of fielded space connected with con uh, coniferous forests. They don't specifically need coniferous forests, but you, got, you wanna make sure that you're looking in a in, uh, forest that has a lot of snags, a lot of woodpeckers. Woodpecker activity is gonna be a huge indicator that screech owls can live there because they don't have a beak for drilling their own holes. The woodpeckers are the apartment builders for owls. So that you can be, they can be found in city areas, roosting in people's trees in their yards. Again, if there's woodpecker activity, boom, you got definite hope that a screech owl could stay there. But places like Blamford, where it's a forest in the middle of the city, or you go all the way up in the Upper Peninsula, they're pretty common. A lot of times I've known noticed that with owls, because their schedules are so much different than ours, one of the best ways to know that one is around is with your ears. So what does a screech owl uh, sound like? <laughs> They're one of my favorites. So when I explain calls to kids and adults alike, there is the great horned who has a few notes, there is the barred owl who has many notes, and then there's the screech owl whose note continues on. So they're more of a So it's this high pitched descending trill. And then once they get irritated enough because you're messing with their space or maybe they're trying to tell you that that's their food and you're not going to take it from them, it'll turn it from this to this and that's when you're getting the business because the next business is probably talons. You wanna be cautious. Most of the time when people tell me that they were attacked or nearly attacked by an owl, my question to you is, what were you up to at that time? And if you're getting too close to their nesting space, yeah, they don't have English words to say, buzz off, I have babies here, I have eggs here. So they might give you the talons, they might swoop at you, they might give you the beak clicking and head swaying. And so it's important to ethically bird when you're out during nesting season. We always end our episodes with tips tips. And when I met you three years ago and I was a new birder, you encouraged me to go out with no expectations. Why is that a good tip for our viewers? Because I think disappointment is one of the biggest reasons that people stop doing things. And the book Owl Moon, if you're familiar or not familiar with it, one of the main repeated phrases in that book is sometimes there's an owl and sometimes there's not. And that is a true statement that sometimes you go out with the hope of, well, I was told that this species is gonna be located in this area, so I have to find it. But you have to be open to the expectation of, you might not find that animal. 
whether it's a bird you're looking for or a mammal, a cute little muskrat eating something, but also there's so much more than just what you're out there targeting. So being open to the experience that you could have that maybe you didn't expect. And sometimes when there's no owl, sometimes there is, sometimes there's not, the big thing to focus on is I gave myself a chance for fresh air. I gave myself a chance for exercise. I gave myself a chance for a change of scene and all of that is good for our mental health. So I think my favorite thing about going out with expect without expectations is to prevent myself from being incredibly disappointed so that I want to go back again next time. Thanks one more time to Sarah and thanks to the Blandford Nature Center for having us. If you haven't been here on the west side of Grand Rapids, Blandford Nature Center is a wonderful place to take the kids. Until next time, I am your host, Matt Garden. This is Michigan Bird Nerd on 13 Plus and the 13 On Your Side YouTube page.